Black Remater by Storm Constantine. He breathed a stream of stars, each mote of light igniting in his lungs, bringing a hot, sweet taste to his tongue. Space, time, what are these trifles? Solonaeus de Cavanigi, navigator of the imperial trader ship Dia Brava, coasted the warp tides of neural ecstasy. Oblivious of all save his own blistering responses and the guiding screamlight of the Astronomicon, the Emperor's own psychic beacon, searing through the heat of chaos. He and the ship were one, a shining world speeding through the warp, his consciousness the benign god that nourished it. Real space drop minus fifteen. Sol realigned consciousness. The warp screen on the helm just in front of him was pulsing dully, displaying a convulsion of lesser eddies in the immaterium outside. Nothing too worrying. He glanced upwards through the translucent plastic wrist of the navigation blister into an aching tumult of colour and optical noise. This was overlapped by his warp sight, courtesy of his third eye, a mutation peculiar to the navigator's which transmuted the chaotic fluidium of warp space into recognisable symbols. A phantom of his mother's face gaped inches from the translucent blister, evoking the thought response, Damn, I forgot the call. He had meant to ask the ship's astropath to transmit a message back to Earth for him before the jump into warp space. He knew that Latinia, his mother, fretted during his absence more than she did for any other members of the family. Out of consideration, he'd always sent brief communications whenever he remembered. Now some deep shred of guilt within his mind had projected a thought form into the warp, which was currently scratching at the ship itself, as if trying to reach him. Real space drop minus ten. He felt Dia Brava stir around him, as the automatic real space navigation functions began to relieve him from duty. She was a witch queen of the heavens, was the Brava, a sleek little strumpet, one of many owned by the affluent Phidias merchant family, who for centuries had enjoyed lucrative merchandise from the Imperial Administratum. Sol had been working for the clan Phidias for some time now, following injuries incurred during military service. He had warped pilot the battlecruiser Vale of Hecate, a crueler, less beautiful lady than the Brava, for three missions before a hideous accident during what should have been a routine purge of mercantile dissidents had decimated the crew and left Sol little more than a disassembled jumble of bones within a leaking bag of flesh. Mercifully, because of his family's prestige, he'd immediately received the best of medical attention through reconsecration and a frozen trip home to recuperate. The healing had been a long, wearing process. His body still creaked with frissions of old pain occasionally. He comforted himself with the thought that one day the administratum would accept his reapplication for duty, deciding at last that his faculties were once more sharp and ready enough to entrust with the welfare of a battlecruiser. Sol, though still mourning the thrill of such commissions, also suspected his yearnings to return to the Imperial fleet were slightly insane. He had a cosy little niche within the Phidias fleet, and the Dia Brava was a dream to work with. Over the last three ship-time years he had spent in her company, he had come to appreciate her personality. Her totem was one of recklessness and adventure, perhaps like himself. She fretted impatiently at being confined at the routine function of cargo carrier. 
The phantom of Lieta lost its hold on the slick surface of the blister and was churned into the amorphous boiling that the dear Brava left in her wake. Sol became aware of physical pain. His neck was playing up again. That was another thing he'd meant to do before entering warp space, consult the medic about this problem. It had not been an easy trip out all round this time. He would not be sorry to get home. One more drop, and then... Real space drop, minus five. Sol smiled. The warp portal into rail space was a stunner this time. Dia Bravo was dwarfed by an incredible apparition in the void ahead. Brazen gates miles high, miles wide, encrusted with elaborate carvings. Giant beasts, their heads invisible in a smoke of stars, blue mammoth horns as if to bid the ship farewell with a star-shattering fanfare. Sol shook his head. Was it his own influence, he wondered? No, the psychic, flutium-bending whim of another navigator, bored after a long stint alone. Perhaps the illusion had been spawned by the creative residue of some dazed Eldar poet who had once coasted the warp tides, coaxing dreams to reality. Whatever. Someone, somewhere, liked to leave their own signature upon the warp. Three drops back, he'd cruised the ship through a yawning, fanged-toothed mouth whose gullet delivered him into real space near one of the Ministorium administrative worlds. Somebody with a sense of humour, maybe. The inevitable and thankfully brief spasm of nausea vibrated through his flesh as Dear Brava left the warp. He couldn't resist glancing over his shoulder as he pulled his bandana back into place over his third eye. There were no mammoth gates closing behind the ship's tail. Of course not. Journey completed, Sol touched a sequence of protective runes above his control helm, then lightly laid his fingers upon his brow. I thank thee, Lord Emperor, divine father of all that lives, for thy endless love that reacheth out to the concerns of forever, and carries us all, thy children, in safety. Blessings and respect. He rubbed his eyes when the prayer of thanks was recited, and began to unstrap himself from the navigator's pod. His neck was singing in agony now. It would have to be seen to before the next warp shift. Whatever projections Dia Brava might have, Sol was always deeply relieved when they dropped back into real space, even if he never consciously admitted it. Sometimes the things he saw out there were just too tempting. One sleep time, he'd had a nightmare about the Astronomicon suddenly blipping away to nothingness, leaving him alone without guidance in a ship screaming blindly into entropy. He'd woken up sweating and pouring at the air, his ultimate fear being that his dream self, despite being terrified, had also enjoyed a wild exultation. He had yearned for the final embrace of chaos. If his subconscious toyed with such sentiments in his sleep, Sol was all too aware of how vulnerable he was in the warp. But then, who wasn't? He'd seen the burnouts, shielded by their families, newly released from Ministorum retreats, where the priesthood tried to launder the frazzled brains of those who had succumbed. It was a risky business he was involved in, his lifeblood. Sol descended to the walkway leading to the camera recruiter, rubbing his neck as he walked. It was always the same, the aftermath, vague depression, insecurity. He knew very well by the time the next warp shift was due, he'd be aching to ride the stuff of chaos once more. Captain Grayan Phidias was giving in to his usual ritual of inspecting the cargo now they'd dropped back into real space. He was aware that this was slightly neurotic behaviour. Nia Brava herself would know if anything was amiss, but could never talk himself out of doing it. Maybe with time his concerns would lessen. He was a young man, and the Brava, one of the family's smaller vessels, had not long been entrusted into his care. Like Sol, he was eager to return home. There had been a series of mishaps this trip, an unexpected bout of illness among the crew, a near miss with a warpstone near the gate to Hover Nesta. Problems with the consignment of goods on Phaeton South had caused an irritating delay, thus upsetting the receivers on the following drop. Problems, problems. 
Brian was also concerned about the ship's new astropath, Shavinia. This was her first trip out with the Diabrava, her first trip aboard any space-faring vessel, in fact. She had been assigned to take over from old Bezos, the previous astropath who had been with the Phidias family all of his working life. Astropaths were essential to communication aboard ship, and Grayan felt uneasy about the apparent delicacy of this girl, her strange air of fainness. He had trusted Bezos implicitly. He had been a robust and dependable creature. Grayan mistrusted Shivinia's capability. Despite the impressive references in which she'd been dispatched from the Scholistica of Adeptus Astra Telepathica, she seemed little more than a child, though Grayan had to admit, however grudgingly, that she had a keen mind. If anything, her ability to transmit and receive information surpassed Bezos's considerably. His misgivings were instinctual, but until he could identify some fault or another, he had no proper cause for complaint. As he walked through the cargo hold, Grayan unconsciously ran his fingers fondly over the ribs of the vault. Very quickly, his ship had seemed to become part of his soul. He felt her movements and sighs, each creak and moan, as if he'd made them himself. Her arched vaults, plated in dull black plasteel, were thickly inscribed with protective runes and totems. She was a virtual fortress. As he'd expected, everything was in order. He knew it was apprehension about the next cargo that was making him jittery. Maybe it was an honour that his father trusted him enough to take the job, but Grayan suspected even the most experienced captain would think twice about having a consignment of lacrimator on board. Naturally, most of the legends surrounded it would be exaggerated, but unnerved by the mishaps he'd had to deal with already on this ship, Grayan fought a superstitious fear that picking up the lacrimator would only create further dangers. Taking one last look around, Grayan forced himself to leave the hold and make his way to the Recretia. All Phidias ships had a member of the Ministorium on board, so that the cleansing rituals could be performed after every warp shift. He'd met Solonatus in the passageway two decks up, considering the navigator was looking as fey as Shivana nowadays. Navigators were all inclined to a pellucid delicacy, but Sol's huge dark eyes were almost feverish. Grayan made a small formal bow, which jerked the navigator's mouth into a smile, not entirely devoid of mockery. Our time? No. You look tired. I am tired. Sol had to quell resentment of the captain's officious manner occasionally. What did he expect? His navigators to come bursting out from the blister, leaping with joy and fatality? Phidias looked offended by his tone. However... So Sol decided to make amends. I always look tired after a drop. What's wrong with your neck? Sol abruptly dropped his hand. Nothing much. Well, get it seen to. Grayan attempted what was clearly supposed to be a fatherly smile, but which Sol meanly interpreted as condescension. Well, we mustn't keep Brother Gabius waiting. Sol shook his head warily at the captain's retreating back and followed him up to the wreck. Patience, patience, he told himself. Dear Brava was coasting serenely towards a cool blue gem of a world, which could be clearly seen through a narrow arch point of the wreck. He knew that Phidias was making a pickup here rather than a delivering, and it was the cargo that the Phidias clan were especially eager to get their hands on. Because of it, everybody had been promised a bonus when they returned home. Sol presumed this was to override any misgivings the crew might have about sharing confined space with Lacrimata, a potential destructive material. Personally, he felt no apprehension. Recorded incidents of fatality had all derived from negligence, which certainly wasn't one of Phidias's failings. Sol never knew whether to respect or be annoyed by the captain's nitpicking. He was not that much older than Phidias, yet sometimes Sol noticed a jarring immaturity in the captain, which in bitter moments he felt derived from Grayan's lack of hardship in life. The captain tried hard to establish comradeship with his navigator, which Sol was well aware of, but neither of them could ever relax enough for a friendship to develop. Sol felt it was something to do with his mutation, 
ignorant of how adept he was at freezing people off. Typically, Grayon asked Sol if he'd like to accompany him down to the planet's surface. Sol winced inside as the captain made awkward references to the delights to be found below. Salome Nigera was one of those legendary places of the space lanes, rumoured to be home to a thousand thousand illicit pleasures, all of which were available to discerning travellers for an appropriate fee. Sol, a unfailing cynic, perhaps a burdensome trait of his kind, knew it was the inhabitants of the planet herself who had engineered and now maintained this reputation. He considered it to be a tourist retreat of the most tawdry kind, and would prefer to curl into his sleep cell for a well-earned rest, rather than force himself to endure the pantomime of being shocked and delighted by what they might find below. Phidias, however, insisted the trip would do so good, even in the face of mordant uninterest, kept on insisting until the navigator gave up. We visit the cargo, Gildo Palomar. I organize delivery of the cargo, and then the rest of the drop is ours, Graham said with a boyish grin, which Saul had to admit was almost endearing, if you like. Though, as you noticed, I am in a little pain. Your totems look worn, Saul. Perhaps you should have them renewed. I'm sure Gabrius could do that for you. Saul's hand absently clutched the Navis Nobelite amulets hanging from his throat. At the risk of sounding irreverent, it is not a spiritual injury, he said, stemming any sharpness in his voice. An aromic rub should do the trick. I intended to visit Hermes Foss before the last drop, but it slipped my mind. Relic of old duty, you know. Graham nodded gravely. He barely spoke of Sol's previous commission, emitting restraint that made Sol feel vaguely like a defrocked priest. Occasionally he wished people would ask him blatant questions about his past, and be humanly curious. Inside he needed to talk about it. The suspected old man Phidias had charged everybody with dire command not to upset him in any way by raking up old hurts. Gomery Phidias was a good friend of Sol's own father, and the commission had been a favour. Well, Graham said brightly, rubbing his hands together, maybe we can find you a sweet young heritor, gifted in the arts of massage. As you know, the city of Asiron is famed for its therapy shrines, a far more stimulating experience than have an old foss grounding away your bones. Eh, so <laughs> He laughed. Sol smiled thinly and inclined his head. As long as we carefully inspect the aromatics before submitting to the moment and the treatment, of course... He felt a weak surge of expectation. Perhaps the planet fall wouldn't be as grueling as he feared. Several other crew members were gathered in the shuttle, intent on visit Asiron. Brother Gabrius among them, which caused a certain amount of good-natured mockery. Gabrius settled himself fussily into a seat, pretending to be affronted. May all your tongues be black, he said grandly. All I seek is an assortment of Pussyant fumes. This you know. So call away as you like. We'll see the grins wiped from your faces when we're back in the warp, and only my incenses keep the effluent of chaos from your sweet, untainted minds. He wriggled his considerable frame into a comfortable position. Come, pilot, let away. Night spreads a black feathered fan upon the bosom of Asiron, and I, for one, want to be on the streets before the essence blenders close their shops. Well said, brother, Grain agreed. Pilot, are all are aboard. Activate the elementals of the portals. The cramped shuttle was filled with the excited atmosphere generated by those who expected to sample exquisite dissipation in the near future. The pilot acknowledged the captain's request with a carefree gesture and made to seal the ports. A sharp cry stayed his hand. Hold! It was the astropath, Shivanya. Shivanya, Grain said unable to control his surprise. I really don't think Azeron is the sort of place. Enough, Captain. I have eyes in the back of my head, if not in the front. I'll be safe enough, especially with all these gallons to protect me. None of the party looked especially flattered by that. Chaperoning a blind girl, not having been on their agenda for the evening. The shuttle felt ominously quiet. Chivanya appeared oblivious of the response, nor else ignored it. She found her way to a seat as nimbly as any sighted person, turning her head back at Graham. She was wearing an embroidered mask over the upper part of her face. The two thread-woven eyes stared at the captain owlishly. 
You're not going to deny me permission, are you, sir? She asked sweetly. Well, we do have business, Graham began, in the voice of somebody who was wondering how he could eject the girl. Oh, leave her be, Saul said. I'll be glad to offer you my arm, Chevanya. He smiled at the captain. What about your neck? Graham asked. He looked disappointed, if not mortified. Saul shrugged. It can wait. We've been all cooped up for weeks. I, for one, would not deny a person the chance to stretch their legs on solid ground, if they desire it. I thank you, Navigator, for your courtesy, Shivanya said, formally, but there was laughter in her voice, mocking laughter. She directed the needle of her attention at the priest. Ministorium duties, planetside brother? Gabrius shifted uncomfortably. Of a kind. Naturally, I would have offered to accompany you, but... He began, but Graham silenced his apologies. Come, come. The matter is settled. Let's fly. Aceron was a remarkable confection of a place. Her streets were paved in pearled marble. Her towers rose, tier upon tier, a flutter with penance advertising which services could be found within. Sulky eyes, painted on silk, gazed through laced fingers the perfumed breezes causing them to ripple as if alive. Grain had already made up his mind he wanted the navigator with him when he visited the Palomar residence, so Chevanya ended up joining them as well. Rather than use public transport, the captain insisted they walk on foot to admire the city sights. Sol was disappointed. The main form of conveyance was provided by elegant open carriages drawn by beasts of burden native to the planet creatures that seemed to be an absurd blend of camel and dog. He would like to ride in one. Perhaps he, later, with the astropath, could hire one for a while. Shivanya, extending her heightened senses to encompass all that they passed, kept up an awed commentary, which Saul could tell soon began to get on Graham's nerves. Palomar House was situated in the heart of the Aromatics District, a sweeping pale leviathan of her residence with many low, sprawling workshops to the rear. The air was so filled with the reek of perfume blending, Sol and Grayan's eyes began to water profusely. Chevenia, being blind, did not experience this discomfort. Presenting themselves at the soaring main entrance, its elegance enhanced by its classical simplicity, Grayan and his companions were shown by an impure by an imperious servant into an understated, yet exquisitely furnished salon near the front of the house. Refreshment was bought, pale fragranced wine and tender wafers perfumed with local flower essences. Chevanya exclaimed that Salome Nigra, Niagara. Chevanya exclaimed that Salome must be a world created solely for the pleasure of astropaths. The stimulus is for the nose, the nose, she enthused. Who needs physical sight in such a place? Grain and Sol, still wiping their eyes with their handkerchiefs, were inclined to agree with her. Guido Palma made a grand entrance after a suitable time had elapsed. He was a tall, well-built man, his handsome face set into a perpetual smile. So, he said, leaning back in his silk-cushioned chair, your essay and entreaty to the dark lady of Nepathy. He helped himself to a biscuit, nibbling thoughtfully. Grain and Sol had both leaned forward expectantly. My family had captured the essence of the mystic flower for centuries, he continued. Mysterio Hypnomota, a prayer, a name, a prayer. He sighed. We call her the Lacrimata, the moonskin, the last breath of a favorite concubine. Mysteria, the dark maid of the hidden caves, fragrant, fragile bloom, whose fleeting kiss is spiritual joy whose bitter juice is oblivion. He smiled. His speech was obviously a sales pitch, Sol thought. However, the plain truth would be lacking in romance. The Palmas grew a rare flower in the underground catacombs, whose perfume was highly narcotic, and whose essential oil was a deadly poison if ingested. It could also be sold for ridiculous amounts throughout the Imperium. Naturally, such an honest description would not excite Grain's desire for purchase as much, but then why bother anyway? The Palomas were rigidly discerning about who they dealt with in the world of commerce. 
and the fact that Grain was here at all indicated that the sale had already been finalised with the Phidias clan back on Earth. Grain was just a courier. Palomar obviously liked to romance his merchandise. Saul noticed Palomar was looking at him keenly. Naturally, you want to see for yourselves, his host said with a wider smile. The catacombs were accessible via a single door in the heart of the Palomar workshop. Violet glow strips illuminated the worn stone steps that led downwards into the damp murk. Shivanya slipped her arm through Sol's as they descended. Can you smell her? she whispered. The navigator could feel her trembling. Is this what you came here for? he asked in an undertone. It was possible. Astropaths, being psychic and therefore mystically inclined, would be bound to be interested in the lacrimata. Shivanya squeezed his arm. She did not answer. Here are the beds of lesser maidens, Palabar intoned as they reached the bottom. Terraces of peaty soil, black as grave dirt, swept away into the dimness. Mysteria Puglia, Palomar said. She is destined for all the warm throats of the ladies of the grand houses of all the world. A decoration, merely mimicking the forbidden sensuality of her elder sister. He plucked a single bloom and presented it to Shivanya. For you, my dear, press her well between the pages of your mere libra, and she will greet you with a benediction whenever you go to inscribe your meditation. Thank you, sir. Shivanya said. She sniffed the flower cautiously. Mm, here, so. He leaned over to sample the perfume. Its first note was bright and fruity, descending for a brief flirtation with the cardinal bloom of musk, before rising to a final crescendo of riotous spring flowers. Excellent. You will look forward to your inscriptions from now on, I think. Palomar led them further into the breathing dark. Saul's skin prickled with a weird excitement. He felt as if a thousand sighing creatures of the night were shifting relentlessly on black satin couches round him. Vampire beauty concealed from sight beneath the venomous map of narcotic flower flesh. And dear, Palomar whispered reverently in front of them, the boudoir of the lady herself. Have a care, my friends. She sleeps and dreams. Saul heard Gray and gasp. He himself was holding his breath, but not for long. Ahead of them, a gloomy crypt spread into infinity, its tears snaking between massive columns and arches. Each tear was overflowing, indeed gravid, cancerous, and alive with the convulsions of shimmery, fleshy walls. Bloom upon bloom crawled over their sisters, engulfing, tumbling, sending out whippy suckers festooned with tumulus and buds and the perfume. Saul had to suppress a groan. The sorcerous elixir of it seethed and flexed upon the tongue, the throat reaching down with limber fingers to the belly and groin. No simple cadence here, but a hectic symphony of aromatic notes. The first was fruity, too, but this was overripe, giddy, eruptions of autumn in full swell, sweeping lustily down to the dark woodland of musk and sandal, spiced with civet and abaris, rising orgasmically to the exuberant scream of spring, jasmine, asphodel, and creamy rose, flowers of the flesh. Sol swallowed thickly, dizzy with the aroma that was playing havoc with his sense of reality, never mind his more carnal senses. At his side, Shavania was motionless. Her touch had become vague upon his arm. Palmer let them all sample the agonizing ecstasy of it for a few moments before clearing his throat and saying, Well, I trust you were satisfied, Captain Phidias. Perhaps we can repair to the salon once more to arrange a delivery of your consignment. Rather overcome and silent because of it, Gray and Sol and Shivanya eventually emerged into the streets once more. Shivanya toyed gently with the bloom Palomar had given her, settling it safely behind a talismatic pin on her robes. We reached the tourist quarter, unaware of how they had got there. Cafes and bars lined streets that radiated out from the quaint squares. The aroma of cooking food did something to dispel the enchantment of Palomar's crypt, and Saul suggested that the three of them choose one of the cafes to sample local cuisine. Chevanya agreed enthusiastically, but Crayon, looking sheepish, mumbled something about going on to find the rest of the party. 
Sol, fighting the urge to poke fun and discomfort the captain, merely smiled and told him that he and Shivania would come back at the spaceport in three hours. Ship's time. Grayan gratefully scuttled down one of the alleys. Are you sure you don't want to go with him? Shivania asked, clearly aware of what Grayan was looking for. I don't mind. I'd be quite happy sitting here alone. Really? No, Sol insisted, firmly tucking the girl's hand through his elbow. Come along. This looks like an interesting place. Glazed fowl hanging everywhere. Take a sniff. Shivanya laughed delightfully. I wish I could see you, Shivanya said wistfully as they sat drinking a dessert beverage. I mean, really see you. Your aura is handsome, Navigator, and yet... She shrugged. Believe me. It must be the effect of this little lady here. She touched the bloom in her robes. I suppose I must be ugly to you. Blind as a bat as I am. Shivanya, stop that, Sol said. You are a very pretty girl, as you well know, and I am a rather haggard spectre of a man. Drink your dessert. You haven't seen me without this, she said mournfully, indicating her mask. So show me then. You won't scream? Sol laughed. She was joking, of course. Only behind my hand. I'm not squeamish, Shivanya. Really. Impulsively, she reached up and untied the strings of her mask, lowering it swiftly with an air of challenge. Her eyelids drooped over milky, blind orbs, sunk deep into her skull as if shrunken. Thin, almost pencil-drawn brows shadowed the sockets. It was not gruesome, however, which Sol knew that the girl must be aware of. A test, then. Was she inviting a physical response from him? Disgusting, he said with a laugh. Dress yourself at once. She smiled and replaced the mask. I could ask you to remove yours, Navigator, but there'd be little point. Doesn't it itch? Not at all. Would you be able to see into the warp now, from here, if you removed it and opened the eye? What I would see is the other world of our reality. In a place like this, it might be educational, but rather upsetting, I feel. Strange. I wouldn't have thought you'd be so squeamish. I'm not. Just careful. Tell me, what is your interest in coming down here? You intended to accompany Phidias to his client all along. Of course. Your warp sight lends you a sharp perception. Navigator, Shivanya replied. She was enjoying herself immensely, he could see. She sipped her drink daintily. Lacrimata is a legend. I was curious. Also, if the fables around it are true, it possesses innumerable properties which haven't even been guessed at yet. Really? And which of these legends concerns you? Shivanya laughed. You sound like an inquisitor, navigator. Aren't I allowed a girlish curiosity? Allowed it, certainly. But I very much doubt that is your motivation. She shrugged. The interest was casual, really. It was only a rumour. I'd heard that Lachmata stimulates psychic sight, far beyond what a humble astropath can imagine. She shrugged again, jerkily. However, I've smelled the stuff now, and my inner sight has not improved significantly. I should hope not, Sol exclaimed. Whatever properties the perfume has, it is also very dangerous, and possibly attractive to hostile forces. And that, dear navigator, is probably just as much of a fable as any other connected with the stuff. Palomar has to sell it, doesn't he? It was all just talk. Sol remembered the effect that the lacrimita flowers had on him, and suppressed a shudder. He did not share Chevanya's apparent scepticism. Anyway, I'm bored with the subject, she said. I'm more interested in you. How old are your injuries? What? Shivanya smiled slyly. Oh, come now, navigator. You should know I see more than others. Lacrimator or not, your aura has scars. How did you get them, and where? Sol was impressed. It happened what seems to be a long time ago, and the name is Solanatus, remember? She shrugged. Well? By the time he'd finished pouring out his life history to the girl, they had scant moments to return to the ship.
Sartle felt as giddy as an excited boy as they hurried through the streets, purged and renewed. He'd been waiting for someone with whom he could exercise the past to come into his life, someone free from the drippings of cloying pity. Whoever have thought that this young, quirky girl would be the one? So much for the pleasure vaults of Aceron. Saul had no doubt that what he'd experienced by simply talking in a dim-lit cafe far superseded any delights of the flesh Graham and the others had experienced. Of course, she came tapping on his cabin door while he lay restless in his sleep cell, weary to the bone, yet unable to rest. Of course, she came with the words of reassurance. Rest easy. I ask no more than this of you. And of course it was a lie. And she, lithe avatar of release, cast a shawl of tawny hair across his breast and stroked his brow, saying, Look upon me, navigator, with the eye that sees my soul. She removed his bandana and kissed the closed lid, bringing a fragrant memory of the lacrimata to his throat. She was so beautiful and skilled with dark voluptuousness that, in the midst of their love-making, he did open his eye. Is this woman, he thought, this that I see? Pure female, her overlapping currents of spirit rivaling even the chaos of the warp. He had never thought to do such a thing before. No one had requested it. His eye was a danger as well as an intrigue. A glance could kill. Chevanya, in her blindness, was immune. But she cried that she saw the light of him unveiled, his forehead shedding radiance which she claimed shared the same brightness as the Emperor's own beacon. Heresy. Maybe. If only we had a sample of the cargo, she said, close to his ear. Think what ecstasies we could share. Or what pain, he added. A shiver of presentment summoned a vision of the next warp drop. He alone in his pod, with the dark moving liquid in the vaults below, singing its insidious song to the ever-vigilant powers of chaos. You fear it, Shivanya laughed. Ice and passion of the wounded navigator. She stroked the scars on his chest and belly. I envy you your sight, she said. Afterwards, she curled into his arms, humming a strange little t humming a strange little tune, running her fingers over his smooth white skin, reaching in to wind them in his long, fine hair. Divine mutant, she said. Hush, don't say that. Oh, well, you are. As am I, in truth. Both of us tolerated for our uses. Blessings upon our imperial father that we may find solace with each other. Sometimes, Shivanya, I think you say very dangerous things. She scorned him gently. Faithful navigator, always quick to obey, to bend his back before the whip of imperial doctrine. Shavanya! He tried to ease himself away from her, suddenly feeling that she'd become a twining, suffocating thing. What are you saying? Listen to yourself. I have done that for years, she said sharply. Always listen to myself from the day that the black ship came and took me from my home. You are an astropath. Privileged, honoured, your very soul is bonded with the Emperor's. She sneered. Heh. A bonding that had burned away my eyes. Bonding is another word for slavery, is it not? Saul shook his head in confusion. I will not argue with you, but when you say these things, remember what your fate could have been. And you think this is any better? She sat up, brushing back her hair. Her voice possessed the dry quality of some seasoned, jaded assassin, a woman whose flesh was laced with scars. Saul reflected that you never came within a whisker of knowing someone until they'd shared your bed. It's easy for you to be so complacent, she said bitterly. A ship here, a ship there, flitting around, cushioned by the influence of your great family. What am I, in comparison, a mere slave, leased out by the Scholastica? I do not choose my commission's navigator. Your life is your own. Mine! She turned her face towards him, and the white eyes between their slitted lids looked snake-like. I belong to Phidias and his clan. My freedom aboard this ship is an illusion. No good can come of this talk, Chevanya. She shrugged. Whatever. I have offended you shocked you. For that I am sorry. I like you. Still. She sighed, her voice taking on a wistful note. 
Perhaps it was a mistake to leave ship. I did not want to come back, you know. Saul reached out to touch her. Forget this. Say nothing else. Come back to me. Reluctantly, she curled against his side. Sometimes, she said, a great fear comes to me. I feel as if a depthless abyss waits open at my feet. Not for now, Saul whispered and held her tight. Gray and Phidias supervised the stowing of his cargo, restlessly pacing the cargo vault as members of his crew carefully secured the crates. At Gray's insistence, Brother Gabrius came puffing down the access ramp, clutching a smoking sensor of his recently purchased potent incense and a handful of newly etched talismans to drape around the cargo. We cannot be too careful, Graham said. This stuff, for all its value, is a seductive substance. I am concerned that what may occur should warp leakage steal its way into the ship, Gabrius. I want the whole of the braver consecrated again, in every corner, every duct, every rune re-blessed and anointed. Is this clear? As the bloom of the nebula, Captain, never fear, Grabrius' unparalleled spirit will quell and subdue any effluor, seeking entrance. Grain smiled and patted the priest's bulky shoulder. I know I can trust you, brother. Now I must hunt down our little communication system and ask her to transmit a message to my father. I intend to ask him to have a banquet ready for my crew, courtesy of Clan Phidias. Gabrius grinned. He could breed whole generations of prime beef by the time we get home. It had not gone unnoticed by Graham that some kind of carnal transaction was taking place between his navigator and his astropath. For some reason, this caused him deep discomfort. Chevania, he decided, had a streak of insolence inside her. Perhaps it was this that made him distrust her. Sometimes when he issued a command, he could sense a wry malevolence in her expression, something about the mouth. It worried him that she might alter the sense of the message when she sent them, just out of mischief, to cause him embarrassment and inconvenience. Why should this be? Chevanier may be a laser in comparison, his last navigator's steady but small candle flame, but he could not bring himself to have faith in her. He also feared she might be bad for Sol. After all, who knew what went on in the navigator's head? It was no secret he had been horrifically wounded and had suffered a serious breakdown afterwards. Montgomery had instructed him to treat Sol with care, to look out for him. Graham felt his instincts bridle at the thought of the quick, incomprehensible Chevanya having him in her clutches. He intended to speak severely with his father in return. There was no way he would have that girl on board again. The crew of a ship were an enclosed community, mostly removed from time and space itself, the universe rolling on without them. It was therefore intrinsic to the ship's well-being that the crew resonated harmoniously with each other. One jarring note on the whole delicate structure could fall apart, entirely the kind of occurrence that the foul influences of the warp could get a hook into. This possibility alarmed Graham more than that of engine failure or facing a warp storm. Dia Brava was his kingdom, and he was sensitive to its ambiences. With this in mind, a few days later, when they were approaching the jump zone into warp space, which would lead them finally back to Earth, Grayan accompanied Sol as he made his way to the blister, covertly assessing him for signs of strain and fatigue. Did you get your neck seen too? Hmm? Oh, yes. Foss gave me a working over. It's fine now. Grayan pulled at his lip, standing on the access ramp and watching Sol carefully as he shimmied into the confined space of the blister and eased himself into position. Sol... Can I speak plainly with you? Sol leaned sideways and peered down the ramp. Is that an order? Sol! Sorry, what is it? Shivanya. Oh, Sol began, fiddling with the controls to the warp screen, his face taking on a mulish expression. Grayan fidgeted uncomfortably. I have to speak, Sol, as friend and commanding officer. Be careful. Saul looked at him again, his expression guarded. He wanted to say, What gives you the right to call yourself my friend? But vented his annoyance with other words. 
I am not an invalid, Grayon. I wish you'd stop treating me like some half-fuddled, incapacitated veteran. Quite frankly, much more of this and I'll be forced to resign my position. I am quite over what happened. It has not made me vulnerable. I am an adult, and... All right, all right, Grayon raised his hands placatingly. I had to speak. Appreciate my position. She knows you don't like her, Sol said abruptly, once more adjusting his screen. Now that can't help the situation, can it? Grayon made a non-committal sound. At the risk of further tongue lashing, just how serious is this business with you and her? As serious as any relationship for people in our positions can be. We live for the day. I can't see that it's any of your business, Grayon. Have no worry that it will affect my work. Or hers. Now, if I could be allowed to get on with the business of warp flight. Grayon shrugged, reached up, and slapped Saul's thigh with a assuring gesture, before making his way back to the camera operati, operati, where he would catch up with a little paperwork, leaving the dear Brava in Saul's care. The interview had not progressed exactly as he'd planned. Sol sighed, settled back in his chair, blinking up through the buster to the streaming stars. If only Grayon could know how he too had reservations about Shivania. Reservations, however, that could not compete with that temptation of her body, that sweet soothing of hers. He knew there was an undeniable shred of repulsiveness about her, as compelling as her attractiveness. This, he told himself, was simply because she came out with unwise, heretical statements from time to time. She was young, bitter, with guidance she was sure to overcome the grievances. That her quick flushes of temperament could presage anything worse to satisfaction was unthinkable. She had been trained by the Adeptus Astra Telepathica. Their screening process for removing tainted material was infallible. It had to be. It has to be, he said aloud, as he removed his bandana. The warp was quiet beyond the gate. Streams of pure immaterium boiled lazily on either side of the ship, but seemed unlikely to form themselves into maelstrom conditions. The warp screen showed no inconsistency. Sol dared to hope that this would be an easy journey. A few thought forms flitted in and out of materiality ahead, but they were minor emissions. Sol recited a prayer to the Emperor to enforce his self-protection and banish all anxieties. It was important to maintain a serene psyche during warp travel. He kissed his totems and fixed his concentration on the journey. A short jump. Dear Brava never ventured that far from Earth. Saul began to hum a mantra, improvising the tune. It lifted his spirits, and he drifted into sublime communication with the ship, becoming one with her body, faster than light, faster than thought, an exultant silver fish upon the bottom of this arcane sea. He breathed an essence of salt and spume metaphoric, riding the wave of the Astronomicon as it pulled him homewards. Salt, sea, dune, dune flowers, flowers, fruit, musk, sandal. Sandal? Sol gulped and was pulled into a momentary reality. He inhaled. What? By the Emperor's sweet blood, what was this? Acromata? Impossible. He consulted the warp screen, his head dizzy with the insidious perfume. The blister was full of it. A pulse glowed on the screen, signifying warp activity. But where? Sol wondered frantically. Behind us? Before us? Where? So close. So close. He fixed his eye towards the warp, nothing definite and yet a suggestion of eminence. The Immaterium was excited. He scanned for chaos emanations. Perhaps something had clung to the ship. The screen seemed poised, waiting to bloom with information, denying him the knowledge. He strained his senses to penetrate the cause as the perfume flowed over him in delicious wicked waves, perverting the purity of his concentration. His skin prickled with sweat. The cargo, a focus, he must ignore it. Banish it. The scent was an illusion. He must. So. A husky call. As a lance of pain pierced the muscles of his neck, the navigator's head whipped towards the access ramp. The hatch was open, and there, creeping towards him, naked and glowing as a hot flame, was Shivanya, her mouth open, red tongue licking her lips, hair flowing like a cloud, her fingers idly stroking her breast. The perfume assaulted him in waves. He tried to speak. Shivanya laughed and opened her shriveled lids. Had he thought those dead eyes milky? No. 
They were more than that. Opal, fiery, shifting with a hundred colours. So, she said, shaking her head so that her lustrous hair seethed like a nest of furred vipers. Come to me. The essence is my flesh. It gives me sight. I have anointed my eyes. I see. I see so much. I see you. No, he said in a strangled voice. He felt as if the very substance of the dear Bravo was melted before his eyes. All that existed was the pale, shining form of the astropath and the hideous seductions of the warp waiting to take them in her final, everlasting embrace. No. What is this no? We are in our place, are we not? Mutants, we. I can hear my sisters calling, vapours upon warp tides. All those that die, all those that die, you slide the ship upon a torrent of their blood. Open that great eye of yours and really see. Look at me, touch me, open the blister and take me home. For a few moments, Sol wondered whether he was hallucinating his own desires. Is this what I want, what I've always wanted? Then Shivanya reached out a hand to touch him, her fingers flexing, curdled eyes blinking and leaking sluggish tears. She hissed and smiled. I spit your seed into chaos, she cried, and lunged to throw herself into the blister upon him. Acting reflexively, Sol winced back and then, with an extreme spurt of effort and will, pulled himself from the chair and flicked out his leg to kick the axis way shut. He heard an agonized squeal, an infinity of violent colors smacked against his warp sight, bringing peals of agony, pain he could not imagine in the worst of nightmares. His body writhed and his stomach convulsed. The surface of the blister was a swarm with foul shapes, all grinning, all scratching, telling him with sickening gestures all of what they planned to do with his body when they reached it. Sol tasted salt. He knew he was biting his tongue. He slammed his head against the console, screaming, Phidias! Gabrius! Anyone! Anyone! But the communications node seemed a million miles away, beyond his reach. Had the ship left its course, his eye was blind to the root, seeking only a tangle of voluptuous shapes that beckoned and tempted, promising eternal pain, external, internal, eternal ecstasy. He could hear Shivanya scratching at the hatch, her voice a hoarse whisper of desire. My Lord Empress, all screamed, help me, help me. With a pure strain of unadulterated thought forced its way through the melee. Take my hand, it said. I am with you, Navigator. Take my hand. With that, he focused on the beam, his consciousness flowing with it, melding with it, following. Although he knew in his heart the Emperor was cocooned within his palace on Earth, his aged, tortured body kept alive by machines, the navigator spirit saw a figure walk the Astronomicon's beam as if it were a shining path, leading the dear Brava away from danger, dismissing the Ifriwa of the warp with its strength and grief of its soul. A vision of his faith maybe. But to Sol, it was the Emperor himself, spirit walking in the void. Some moments later, he came to a kind of reality, and realized that the fluidium outside was quiescent, the warp screen clear of clots. There was no sound beneath the hatchway, and the fume of Lacrimata had left the blister. He was the dear Brava, and they swam the wave of the Astronomicon, embraced by the spiritual essence of a thousand martyrs. Swimming home. Did you call me, Sol? Back in real space, Grey and Phidias was at the blister even before Sol had unbuckled his safety harness. I thought I heard a call, but the ship's mind told me otherwise. Even so, I thought I'd better check. Are you all right? Sol looked terrible. His white face, slick with sweat, dark shadows around his eyes. He had not replaced his bandana just sat in his chair, like a corpse, or someone drugged, a mutant eye staring dully at the warp screen. Averting his gaze, Grayan squeezed into the blister alongside him, and gently tied the bandana back into place. What happened? he asked. So, he gave the navigator a shake. Sol shuddered, jerked, and then gulped air, ship's air, faintly metallic, rubbery sweet, and, thankfully, free of perfume. He sighed and momentarily leaned against the captain. 
The instant was of silence, suspended heartbeats. Then he pulled away. Many die to keep the Astronomicon alive, don't they? He said. Not unwillingly. You know that. Phidias had a horrible dread. Sol had suffered a further breakdown. What? Sol shook his head quickly to silence him. No, the cargo, it has been tampered with. What? Impossible. I would have been informed. Nevertheless, what I say is true. It was protected. Sol looked at him bleakly. Yes, undoubtedly, as I am. Always, believe me, Graian, I am not mistaken. Phidias rubbed his face uncomfortably. You are ill, Sol. Get yourself out of that chair. I'll take you to Foss. Sol leaned back in his chair and uttered a low, bitter laugh. Hill, am I? Take me somewhere where I can talk to you, Grey and Phidias. Play the part of being the good friend you have always professed to be. I have a favour to ask of you. She was in her cabin, dressed in her finest robes, brushing out her hair. She wore her mask, the eyes unseeing, staring into nothing. I thought you would come, she said, laying down her brush. Sol didn't comment. I have something for you, he said. A gift. It is the best I can give you under the circumstances, Shivanya. I know you will understand and use it wisely. She accepted the gift, closing her fingers over the small crystal bottle. Her laugh was shaky. Well, so, there goes your bonus, I suspect. Such generosity. Not generosity, Shivanya. I loved you, in a way. It is compassion. Merely that. A report will be made to the Scholastica when we return. You know what its verdict will be and its consequences. You are tainted. You must know that. You complained before about your lack of freedom. Well, if you reach Earth, your life aboard this ship will seem like paradise. They will send you to feed the Emperor's soul. Because of what we shared, I wish to spare you that. Thank me. I grant you your dearest wish. A full draught of the Maiden of Oblivion. If you are lucky, for a moment, you'll have the sight you craved. He left immediately, and for a while Shivanya sat motionless, the bottle held in her lap. She could not cry, no matter how much she yearned for that release. Her lips shook around the shape of his name. He'd possessed a strength that she had not anticipated. To her, a hideous strength. Then she opened the bottle. The sensuous aroma flooded her cabin, sweet with desire, loss. Its crescendo was the last damp fires of autumn before the winter comes, when all is burnt, the rubbish from the fields, the dead wood. She smelled dark earth and sensed a welcoming somewhere. With shaking hands, she tipped a little of the essence onto a single finger, and anointed her throat. Moonskin, Lacrimata, Lady of Tears, Dark Sister, not for the weak, oh no. As the siren scent rose around her in a final embracing cloud, Shivanya tilted back her lovely head on her perfect neck, and tipped the contents of the bottle down her throat. For a few fiery seconds her body danced and sang, a manic dance of endurable beauty and passion, but it was only for a few seconds. It was a swift death. I know it's hard for you, Gabriel said, but you acted in the noblest way, Sol. The priest fondly patted the navigator's shoulder. They were sitting in his chapel vault beneath the light of benediction. It had been a difficult confession. Come now, lift your head, young man. Phidias is pacing outside like a brooding leopard. Don't give him cause for concern. Be strong! Why, though? Sol asked helplessly. Why her? She was so... Tainted! Gabrius interrupted sharply. Believe it, Sol. The lacrimata was merely a catalyst, and a lucky one in the event. Worse could have occurred if you think about it. You bested the powers of chaos in your own way. No trivial feat, I assure you. No system is infallible. There will always be mistakes. The Adepsis Astra are thorough, but their dominion is vast. 
Because of this, it is inevitable that the odd blight slips through their screening net. It is true she might never have succumbed, and that the essence itself was the cause, but that is irrelevant, really. Live your life, Navigator. Forget her. In scant days, we will be home, and your family awaits you. And don't forget the feast Phidias has promised us. Sol nodded, kissed the priest's belt, and backed away from the vault. Grayon was waiting outside, as Gabrius had told him. One thing I have to know, Sol said. Lacrimator. Where is it bound? The Adeptus Terror would never allow such a substance to pass hands in the free market. Surely. Who commissioned its purchase? Grayon scratched his neck, wrinkled his nose. Well, Guido Palomar is indentured to one department back on Earth. Just one the dispersal of the perfume, the true Lacrimata, is rigorously controlled. Who bought it, Grayon? He sighed. The Inquisition. Sol laughed. I should have known. An instrument of torture. Hardly a matter of humour. You think not? We live in a universe of contradictions, my friend, to our continual delight. Now I suggest we repair to the Recreator to toast our fair earth when she reveals herself in the heavens. The Inquisition. <laughs> he shook his head. You look better, so Phidias said bleakly. The navigator was already striding away up the passageway. He flung a remark over his shoulder. Just a reprieve, my friend. Just a reprieve. That was Lacronata. If you've enjoyed this reading, then please check us out at fluffandhammer.weebly.com and have a look at us on at patreon.com forward slash fluffandhammer. Thank you for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed this reading.